Okay, good morning. Glad to have you with us this morning. Uh, we're studying the book of James. We're in the third chapter. Uh, I want to explain a little bit about what, what I'm doing here at, at the beginning. Uh, first of all, there is a sheet going around in regard to the church picnic. The church picnic will be next Saturday. And uh, if you'll be able to help anyway, I think there are three areas of work where they need help. Setting up things, then uh, cleaning up, and so forth. So if you're able to help in that, if you'll sign up that sheet that's being passed around, that would be a great help to us to know uh, how to plan these things out. But we appreciate it. Look forward to that. The church picnic is always a great time for fellowship with one another. Uh, and just enjoy ourselves being there together, playing games and uh, eating some good food. So uh, if you can, can, make sure to be here. That'll be next Saturday uh, for that church picnic. Okay, we're in, like I said, in the book of James, in the third chapter. And what I had done, oh, two or three weeks ago, when we'd got down to, to verse, uh, uh, let's see, verse 15, where it talks about the wisdom that is earthly, that is uh, demonic, uh, that is animalistic, you know, uh, uh, the bad wisdom that comes from this world, from men. And we wanted to compare that and did so with the good wisdom that comes from above, from God. And that's mentioned uh, in verse uh, 17. And so in doing that and looking at these two and comparing them, I just had skipped right over verse 16. And verse 16 is important. Uh, so I'd begun last week just mentioning about this. But, but verse 16 says, For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing will be there. And so, as we began looking at this, this idea, where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Most of the translations, or many of the translations anyway, uh, have the word jealousy here instead of envy. And in fact, one translation, I think that it's the American Standard, but I'm not sure. I was not able to get on the computer this morning to check that out again, but I remember reading it. One of the translations says, bitter jealousy. Instead of envy, it says bitter jealousy. Uh, when you think about jealousy, what comes to mind? What, what do you think jealousy is? Yeah, wanting what somebody else has. Maybe wanting something exactly like what they've got, or maybe even wanting specifically what they have. Uh, it could be jealousy. But like I said, and I checked in the Greek, and the Greek does have the word bitter there. And I believe it's the American Standard that calls it bitter jealousy. Now, bitter, literally, bitter has to do, you know, something that tastes bad. It's very harsh tasting. But there, there's also a sense in which the word bitter is used figuratively. And it's used to that which causes pain or harm to someone. And so a bitter jealousy would be... Uh, that jealousy that's going to cause harm to someone else. Now, a lot of the translations, and I know the New King James, which I've been using in this class, uh, just renders this as envy. And I remember several years back reading about envy uh, and the different meanings that it has in the New Testament. And there's one word of envy that carries with it this idea, not so much of, of wanting what somebody else has, not even necessarily wanting exactly what they have, but it's the kind of, of jealousy this envy is that would be happy if they lost whatever it is they have. Uh, and so there would, I think, that would be bitter jealousy. Something that would cause pain and hurt to another. You know, sometimes people can be so uh, jealous of other people and what they have that, that they could be made happy again if that person just lost what they had. And so that's the thing I believe he's talking about here. And wherever he says that kind of envy and self-seeking is, well, what is self-seeking? I guess that kind of says it itself. Uh, but a self-seeking person we would think would be someone who is, who is selfish, who's only looking out for himself to get what he wants. Uh, so wherever this is, uh, there's going to be confusion and there's going to be every evil thing. Uh, and we mentioned the fact 
The word that's translated here as envy or jealousy is the Greek word zealous. Uh, we get that transliterated sometimes just for zealot. Uh, someone is zealous of something. What does that mean? They're striving for what? Yeah, the, the word zealous, think about when, when Jesus went into the temple to cleanse that temple. He turned over the tables of the money changers. He made a scourge and he drove out the, the people that were selling the, the sheep and so forth in there. Uh, and when the disciples saw it, they recalled what had been prophesied, that the zeal for thy house has eaten me up. When Jesus overturned those tables and drove out those money changers and those who were selling, uh, he was showing his zeal for the house of God. And it's the same word that's used there. And so it's something that can be good or it can be bad. And usually when we think of it here, it's got that word translated as envy, letting us know this is talking about the bad side of it uh, that, that a person has. They'll act to do something, but they do it out of bitterness and out of anger or out of uh, jealousy of the other person and what they have. And so that's the type of thing that he's talking about. And, and where that exists, there's going to be confusion, as I said, and every evil thing. Uh, but there's also the self-seeking. Now, this is something that I found intriguing. Uh, I looked up uh, what Brother Guy in Woods had to say about this in his commentary on James. And, and he pointed out that the word here that's used, erythean, is the Greek word. And it's something, he says, you trace it through history. And, and you find the, the meaning of it changing a little bit. And he gave six different definitions for this same word uh, as it kind of evolved. Uh, first of all, he said it began uh, to refer to one who was a spinner of wool. Now, you take the wool off of a sheep, and they spin that uh, into material, into thread that can be used to make clothing. And it was used to the person that did that, the spinner of wool, somebody that owned sheep. The uh, purpose of owning sheep was for the clothing they can get from it. To get that wool, they cut the wool off the sheep. Then they have to spin that wool into thread to be used to make clothing. Uh, so that's one way. That's the way it began. But then it, it slowly evolved into one who was hired to spin wool. Not, not necessarily the person that owns the sheep that supplies the wool. But then he goes out and hires someone to spin that for him. And so it was used of that individual. Thirdly then... It came to mean a hireling. Uh, and that's a word you'll read in the New Testament. Uh, of those who, who keep sheep as a hireling. A hireling is someone that doesn't own the sheep. But he's been hired to watch out after the sheep. And in the New Testament, many times when Jesus talks about it, uh, he always talks about it in a bad sense. Uh, the hireling is somebody who doesn't really care about the sheep because they're not his. He's only doing it because he's being paid to do it. And that really became the idea of a fourth idea, a selfish person who's interested only in wages. And so a person that does his job, if it's watching after the sheep, he does it only because he's getting paid for it. Now, if trouble comes up, if a wo if wolves come or a lion or a bear after the sheep, what do you think that hireling's going to do? He's going to flee for his own life. You know, he's not going to endanger his life for it. And that's kind of the idea that's given in the New Testament in times when Jesus talks about those who are hirelings. They're selfish, interested only in wages. Then number five, it was used of a partisan who's concerned with one's own affairs. Not concerned about anybody else, but only concerned about himself. And then finally, number six, Brother Wood says it came to mean one who resorts to evil measures to accomplish one's desires. And that's really where we get to here in James when he talks about this. Uh, that, that type of thing. And wherever you've got that, that self-seeking, he's only concerned about himself. He's willing to do whatever evil has to be done to get what he wants done. Yes, sir. That's one of the things I've gotten written down here about that. But no, wait, wait, wait. What, what you said, I never thought about. 
you know, she spun a yarn. You know, that ties in figuratively with that very good because she did. She told a lie that, that accomplished the death of Naboth and got that vineyard for her husband. But that's, that's an excellent way of putting that. I never thought about it in that way. Uh, but you just think about these things. You, you're you're going to find these things in the world. These are things that come from that false wisdom, uh, the wisdom that men have. These are the things that they would come up with. And, and whenever you have things like this, this envy and this self-seeking, then James says you're also going to have confusion and every evil thing. Now, I think that's a key to understanding something about this too. Uh, someone look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 33. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33. Rusty, do you have that? You can read that for us. Okay. Uh, chapter uh, 14 and verse 33. God is not a God of disorder. The King James, the New King James says, God is not a God of confusion. Well, wherever you have this envy and this self-seeking, there you're going to find confusion and every evil thing. So that tells me this is not something that comes from God, because God's not a God of confusion. And so this is not coming from that wisdom that's from above, it's coming from that wisdom that's earthly, uh, that's animalistic, that's demonic. Uh, and so this is what comes from men, not from God, and that you're going to have these type of things. Now, skipping over verse 15, or verse 17, rather, because we talked all about that, about the, the type of wisdom from above and what it's like, and look then at verse 18. Uh, get all that. I get to talking and stop clicking. Uh, verse 18 says, Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace, by those who make peace. The, the fruit of righteousness. That could be, I would think, in two different ways you could understand that. Uh, the fruit, which is righteousness itself, are the fruit uh, that's produced by righteousness. Uh, and, and so it could be one of either ways. I know that Brother Guy in Woods believes that the fruit here is, is fruit that's produced by righteousness. Uh, so the person who is righteous is going to produce a certain type of fruit in their lives. Uh, and he makes the statement here. He says that the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So the product that comes from righteousness is something that is going to be sown best in times of peace. Uh, when we had Michael Whitworth here a couple of weeks back uh, to talk about... Uh, teaching Bible classes and so forth. He, he had asked the question one time if anybody in there had ever been part of a church that suffered a split. Uh, and, and, and the idea was, you know, when, when a church splits, does that help promote the growth of the church or does that hinder it? It's going to hinder it in a big, big way. And so, you know, when, when a church does not have peace, when an individual doesn't have peace with himself, with his brothers and sisters, you know, and with God, and the church is not at peace, it's not going to be a time to be sowing the fruits of righteousness. It's, it's not going to be successful. We can make every effort we want, but you're not going to have successful then as you could if it's in a time of peace. When the brethren are at peace with God, with one another, and with themselves, and they're working together for that. And so that's the idea here, that this fruit of righteousness is sown in peace, in times of peace. That's the time to do it. But it's sown, it says, by those who make peace. So the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace, and it's sown by those who make peace. Now, who is it that makes peace? I think in regards to, to men, who is it? God makes the peace, but who is it that sows peace? Or who are the... Uh, those who make peace, the text says. Okay. All right. What was the first thing I heard? Peacemakers. It is sown by those who make peace, who, who are peaceable. Well, who are the peacemakers? According to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9. 
I think it was verse 9 that Jesus made this statement. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the sons of God. So the peacemakers, those who, who make peace and those who sow in peace, are those who are sons of God. This is another evidence to us as to our relationship with God. Uh, when we're at peace with ourselves, with, with one another, with, uh, with God, and, and we're involved in sowing uh, the fruit that comes from righteousness. Uh, and Right, and that's, that's, again, that's a person who does that. It's a person who's not at peace with God when he starts uh, doing something different from what God has said and adding to that. And so that, that's, that's the whole idea of it here, is that those of us who are sons of God, if, if we're sowing in righteousness, if we're sowing as those who are peacemakers, we're making peace with other people. Uh, you want to sow the seed uh, of the Word, to reach people, to bring them to Christ, uh, in doing that, you're a peacemaker because you're helping to make peace between that individual and God and peace between himself and, and those who are Christians and peace within himself. So you're a peacemaker. You're a son of God when, when you're doing those things. Now, with, with that in mind, I would really wanted to have our time really get into chapter 4 because there's so much to be said here. Chapter 4 is dealing with this idea of worldly friendship. Uh, verses 1 through 10, but I want to begin just by looking at the first three verses here of it uh, as we talk about this. So uh, the causes of conflict, that's given here in these three verses, the beginning of it. So again, reading now from the uh, New King James Version, James says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. And so the, the cause of these conflicts uh, that come about to us in life. Uh, James had spoken and said about two wisdoms. There's wisdom that's from above, and there's that wisdom that's earthly, that's from the from earth. Uh, the true wisdom is a peaceable wisdom. It sows peace. It makes for peace. False wisdom does not. And so this false wisdom, trusting what men have come up with and what they say, is what leads to these wars and these conflicts. I think primarily it's talking about conflicts within us individually uh, or within the body of Christ, but what he says about that also applies to wars that exist between nations that's coming up and and so as he talks about this in, in regard to that uh how can we have peace uh, if, if we've got that conflict that's going on how can we ever hope to have peace and, and i like the idea that has been expressed uh, about this uh it says how can we have peace first of all you're gonna have to ask answer the question how can we eliminate all war because that's what he's talking about. How can you know we do that? Because where do these wars and conflict come from? First of all, when you talk about the word war, uh, normally when you think of a war, what do you think about? Combat. Uh, and usually combat between nations. And, and it can apply to that. But here he's talking about those wars and conflicts within us. Uh, and so these are conflicts and all that, that happen within the church. Now, the word war would have to be understood in that regard in a, uh, a figurative sense. There's not a little war going on among Christians that he's writing to because that is what he says. He says, where do wars and fights come from? Among you. So he's writing to Christians. So where do these wars and conflicts come from among Christian people? And, and how would that be the case? Or why would it be the case? And, and so we've got to answer that idea. You know, well, well, where does it come from? It comes from these conflicts and this war. But how do you get rid of that? 
Now, where does the war come from? Well, he tells us that war comes from our lust. Uh, and the word lust there is the word, actually it would be pronounced hadanon. Uh, does that sound familiar to anything? What? Hedonism. Uh, well, what is hedonism? Uh, well, hedonism is a philosophy in ethics where, where you're trying to determine what's right to do. What's the best thing to do? And according to hedonism is, whatever brings you the greatest amount of pleasure, that's what you need to do. And uh, people that follow that for a good long while, but then get to realize, wait a minute, what brings me pleasure may not bring pleasure to another person. It may hurt them. You know, because uh, if my desire is for wealth, and, and I want wealth, and so I know somebody's got that wealth, I'm going to steal it from them, because that's going to give me pleasure to have that wealth. But what does it do to that person you steal it from? Maybe a person's desire, his, his pleasure that he seeks, is, is sexual pleasures. And really, that's how that's used most of the time today. It's sometimes called the playboy philosophy, that hedonism. Uh, and so a man, you know, might then physically attack a woman uh, and, and sexually abuse her for the pleasure it brings. But what does it do to her? Uh, and so men began changing their ideas about hedonism to the fact that, well, whatever brings the greatest amount of pleasure to the greatest number of people, then, then that's what we should do. But then you get into problems when you think about things that happened like in Germany uh, in World War II, where the greater number of people within that country, uh, you know, bought into this idea about uh, the hatred for the Jews and need to get rid of them. They're, they're responsible for all the woes that Germany had. And so they, they would do that. So but that's that word, that word, hadanon. Uh, it's translated here as pleasures. Uh, it's found, I think, three times in the New Testament. And R.B.G. Tasker, in his little commentary on this, says it is never used in a good sense. It's always uh, speaking of things in an evil sense. Uh, I've got, got one of the verses I wanted to, to look at in regard to that. Uh, if someone to turn over to Luke chapter 8 and verse 14. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus is explaining to his disciples the parable of the sower that he had taught to them. Luke chapter 8 and verse 14. Who's got that? All right, Billy, go ahead, please. Okay, that word pleasure there that's used in, in Luke 8, 4, it's that same word, hate and not. Uh, it, it's something that people do for the pleasure that they gain from it. Uh, and evil desires, lust of all kinds that he talks about here, uh, lead to all kinds of fightings and conflict in life. And that's where it comes from, from these desires that we have. Uh, I think, you know, history itself show, self shows that Many people who are seeking these pleasures will do just about anything to gain those pleasures, to have that feeling in their life. I mean, they'll lie, cheat, rob, steal, kill, whatever is necessary to be able to get those things they want in life, uh, that they're willing to do that. Uh, these type of lust that we talk about have uh, led to uh, internal battles within the individual that they have. Uh, I remember years back, uh, back at Old Woodlawn, I was just a teenager, and, and I was talking with a young man there uh, who had become a Christian, but he was an individual who had been hooked on drugs, uh, some serious uh, problems with drugs in his life. And, and I was talking to him about it one day, and he was talking about, he said, you know, it had gotten so bad for some of his friends, you know, that they couldn't find a vein to inject the drug into. Their, their veins were collapsing. So it got to the point, he said, where, where they were injecting themselves and the soles of their foot. And I thought, man, alive. What in the world would possess a person 
to do that. And I asked him, I said, I can't believe him. He said, you do not understand the pleasure that's to be found in the relief you have when you inject that into you. It's just unbelievable, he said. Now, everything changes. You just feel wonderful, you know. And that's why you do it. It's the desires, it's the pleasures that come from it that motivate people uh, to do that. Uh, and so that's what happens so many times. And that has happened in causing wars. The desires that people had for things. Yeah, there's a lot of problems that come from that. We're going to talk about some of those things, too, a little bit later about this. But, you know, uh, I, I got to thinking about, you know, causing of wars. Uh, I, I can remember some of the things that I'd learned about World War II and the beginnings of it about it. So I just got on the History Channel, uh, and, and I watched them on TV a lot, a lot of things. And uh, I just copied down what they had said in regard to uh, what, what motivated Germany uh, to invade other countries, to begin the war. And here's what they said. Obsessed with the idea of the superiority of the pure German race, which he called Aryan, Hitler believed that war was the only way to gain the necessary Lebensraum, or living space, for that race to expand. Uh, he, he believed that the Germans, the Aryan race he called, were the pure race. Uh, they were better than everybody else. And, and therefore, they needed to expand and control everybody else. But, you know, to expand and become what they could do, they needed more land. They had to have that, what they called the living space. Well, how are you going to get that living space? It's going to come from wars that they're fighting. Uh, in the mid-1930s, it goes on and says that he, that is Hitler, began the rearmament of Germany secretly and in violation of the Versailles Treaty. After signing alliances with Italy and Japan against the Soviet Union, Hitler sent troops to occupy Austria in 1938 and the following year annexed Czechoslovakia. Uh, he felt like that was the only way to do it, to, to get what he wanted, to have the Germans, the superior race, ruling over everybody. We're going to have to have living space or we're going to have to take it from these other nations. Uh, and so war. Uh, later after that, then, he invaded Poland. And that's what brought then England and France into it because they had treaties with Poland to, to defend them. And so all of a sudden, there's a world war going on. Uh, but it all starts because of the desires that Hitler had uh, to be able to rule the world, believing they were superior people and they needed to do that. So that happens. It can bring about those warfare. But it also leads with these to internal battles within the individual. Uh, again, just think about that. Uh, the lusts of life are the source of the wars and fightings that James says are in your members. And so these wars and fightings that go on occur within your members. It incurs in the life of individual members of the church, uh, these battles. It's not just a battle between nations but it's a battle within an individual themselves. The battles that are going on because of this. A couple of passages. I'd like someone, first of all, turn to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. Because Peter talks about this same idea. First Peter 2, 11. Who's got that? Okay. The passions of the flesh. New King James says those fleshly lust, And they do what? They war against your soul. There's a war going on in the lives of people. Uh, it, it's, it's the desires of the flesh battling uh, against the, the desires that a person has for doing the will of God, for doing what's right. And, and it's warring against your soul. And if it's victorious, it's going to destroy your soul eternally. Uh, one other passage uh, that I want to mention, uh, I think I did put this one on the screen here, hopefully. Uh, well, I did have First Peter too. didn't know it. Romans 7, 23. Paul said, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, 
and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Paul said that law of sin is in my members. What's the law of sin? Well, that's the law that's tempting you to do what's going to please you rather than what pleases God. And that type of, of uh, sin in your life is what brings destruction to you. And those Paul said, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. I think the law of mind that, that Paul's talking about, you know, Paul uh, has grown up as a Jew. He had God's law. Uh, he had in his mind, uh, and you know, like David of old, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. He had that word to help protect him from sin. But then he said, I found there was another law in me that's fighting against this law of my mind. Uh, Paul goes on and he talks about the fact. He says, the things that I would not do, I do. And the things I should do, I don't do. So that war within him, that other war, it's a war of the flesh, it, it's, it's overcoming uh, the war in his mind, uh, the, the law of God that's given to him. And so there's that constant battle going on. And, and that's why we, we need to be aware of that fact that these lusts and desires that we have is what promotes those wars. And those are the things that are seeking to destroy our souls and to bring about our destruction. So, Brother Wood said that James represents these pleasures then as soldiers within ourselves that, that are doing their best to destroy our soul, to fight against us. And uh, well, I thought I'd put this down here. Uh, he, he, he worked it out this way, Brother Woods did. He asked, all right, where, where is strife? Where is it? Well, it's within ourselves. That's what James says. Uh, it's wars that are going on within our members. And so that strife is within us. It's in the individual. Well, why is it there? Why do we have that war going on in our bodies? It's because of the desires that we have. And again, the word desires there, I think he's going back uh, to the word uh, epithemia. Uh, a different word, the ones that are used most often in the Bible to talk about the desires or the lust that we have. And those are the things that are there that's causing all of this. Well, uh, what prompts these desires? What causes you to have the desires that you have? And it comes from the pleasure derived when you gratify those desires. Uh, like the young man I talked about uh, that was hooked on drugs, talked about how that but when you have that, it's, you're prompted to take those drugs because of the gratification you receive from it, the pleasure that grants to you. And so only when those desires are gratified can you have that pleasure, and that's what prompts it. Uh, so what is the result of such? And the result is given then uh, in the next verse, verse 2, when he says, You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war yet you do not have because you do not ask. Uh, you lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. That word murder has been something that, that has bothered a lot of people. And so some translations leave the word murder out and they simply translate your envy. Uh, no, no, you lust and do not have. You envy and covet and cannot obtain. But every uh, Greek manuscript we have and every uh, translation, older translation, we have every older versions, the first thing one's translated out of the Greek, all of them have this word murder in it. And so it seems like that, that people murder, and then after they murder, then they covet whatever it is they're, they're, they're after, and then they still can't obtain it. That doesn't really make sense with it. Uh, and so back in the 1800s, Westcott and Hort, when they did their preparation of the Greek text, which at that time was the text followed by everybody, what they did was offer a change in the punctuation. And so it was translated a, a little bit different from that. Uh, and, I, and I think that... Uh, the Revised Standard maybe gives the best idea about it. Instead of saying, uh, 
you murder and covet and cannot obtain. It says you covet and cannot obtain and murder. In other words, murder is a result of your failure to get what you want. And so when, when you can't get what you're desiring, it resorts in a person willing to take someone else's life to get it. They're willing to kill to get to it. Uh, and so that's the whole thing about it. Uh, it's to have a, this lust, he talks about, he said, has a strong desire for. Uh, and there were a couple of passages. Uh, the first of these uh, uh, that we talk about is, is in Samuel. Uh, and that's the word used, epithemia. Uh, 2 Samuel 11, 1 to 4. It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David and sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. David goes up on his rooftop, and he sees this woman bathing. And the text says she was beautiful. Uh, it doesn't say anything about the desire of David. It doesn't use that word. But obviously that was there. He saw the beauty of this woman and he desired it. As he sent to find out about her, when he learned who it was, then he sent people and they took her, the text says, and brought her to David. And David committed adultery with her. Uh, and so eventually, to hide that, what does David do? Yeah, he has her wife, or her husband, Uriah, killed. And so... He sees something that he desires and he takes it, but he knows he can't have it because it's somebody else's wife, and so he kills her husband. And so he murdered to obtain it. Then, then the other example is the one that uh, Merrill mentioned, uh, 1 Kings 21, 2 to 4. So Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it is near next to my house. And for it, I will give you a vineyard better than it. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. So Ahab went into his house, sullen and displeased, because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and would not eat. Uh, now, we know the results. What happened is that Jezebel comes in, and he tells her what's happened. And her response is, Are you not the king of Israel? And you're letting this little man keep you from what you want? And so, like Meryl said, she spins a tale about Naboth to have him accused of blaspheming against God, uh, a sin that was punishable by death, and he was stoned to death. And then she came, she told her husband, hey, Now, you go take that vineyard. You know, uh, you, you know you, you're the king. You don't have to keep anything from yourself that you want. Well, again, it leads to murder because of the desires, the passions that people had for things that lead them to take the life of someone else. And so this is the danger of these wars that are going on within us, what they can cause us to do. Uh, yet, in spite of that strong desire... Neither one of these really were able to have what they wanted. At least I believe the idea here is that they couldn't have it legally. They couldn't have it with God's approval. Uh, they could not have it by simply asking God for it and expecting God to give it to them. Uh, you know, go back to chapter 1 and verse 5 of James. If any man lacks wisdom, do what? Let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. But you can't ask God to give you somebody else's wife. You can't ask God to give you something that belongs to another person 
who doesn't want to give it away or sell it. Uh, you can't ask God to do something that's contrary to His will. And so, though they desire it, though they, they want it, they can't have it legally, and so they'll do what's necessary illegally to get possession of it. And in each case, it ends up with killing someone in order to bring it about in these two instances. And so, there's the problem that these people have not been able to obtain what they wanted, for which they've lusted. Uh, and James says here, basically it's because they're not seeking things for which they could rightly ask of God. James goes on, he says here in this verse, you have not because you ask not. Now, James is not implying, well, listen, you know, if you ask God uh, for somebody else's wife, he's going to give it to you. No, that's not what he's suggesting. Uh, but in general, we don't have what we desire because we don't ask of God. And we can only ask of God that which is right in God's sight. But if we'll do that, then God will hear and He will give to us. Jesus says, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. Seek, and you shall find. Well, you know, that, that's the promise that Christ made. But it has to be the things that are in keeping with God's will. You can't ask God to give you something that's contrary to His will. Well, our time's gone. We want to begin at this point, Lord willing, next week to talk further and in detail about why it is sometimes that we ask and do not receive what we ask for. So we'll begin at that point, Lord willing, next week. We have about 20 minutes. Yes, sir. There's another one out here in the auditorium already, or in the board. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. So if you didn't get a chance to, to sign that uh, and you want to help, make sure you go out there and sign it. Thank you. So we've got about 18 minutes now until we have our worship hour. Thank you.